Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox and I'd like to welcome you to episode 247 of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. I am proud to announce the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report has a new sponsor, that is the Red Flag Group. I have come on board with the Red Flag Group as its Compliance Ambassador. This new position allows me to further my goals and desires to be the Compliance Evangelist and I'm gonna do it in conjunction with the Red Flag Group now. So uh, please note, uh, we have this new sponsor, the Red Flag Group. If you have any questions about this new sponsorship, I hope you will uh, give me a shout. You can check out the Red Flag Group at theredflaggroup.com. In today's episode, I visit with Stephen Martin. Uh, Stephen's a partner at Arnold and Porter. And uh, in this episode, we take a look at the new Department of Justice pilot program around self-disclosure, cooperation and remediation uh, and the credit you get from this. Uh, It's a new program. I think it's going to provide a lot of uh, information to the compliance practitioner around the uh, program. And Stephen and I, in this episode, talk about why we both believe it's so important. The episode comes in at just over uh, or just under 26 minutes. I hope you enjoy it. And thank you very much for listening. Tom Fox, I'd like to welcome you to this episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. I am privileged to have back again my good friend and colleague, Stephen Martin, who is now at Arnold and Porter. And Stephen and I wanted to explore the recent announcement from the Department of Justice entitled the Fraud Sections Foreign Corrupt Practices Act Enforcement Plan and Guidance. So, Stephen, welcome back. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for having me back. Always great. So, um, we had a uh, actually a I guess a press conference last week uh, where uh, Andrew Wiseman and Leslie Caldwell announced this new policy. It's, uh, I say new because, um, I should probably say that in quotation marks, because it seems to me that there have been plenty of public pronouncements that the DOJ has been leading that have led towards this. I don't think there was really anything in here that I saw as a surprise. Um, but uh, nevertheless, whenever the DOJ speaks, I think it uh, behooves everyone in the compliance community to listen. So uh, what were some of your uh, initial thoughts, Stephen? You know, I agree with you. I mean, obviously, you know, folks in the compliance community pay attention to um, DOJ pronouncements, and certainly when DOJ or the SEC talks about uh, enforcement, what they're focused on, and in this case, you know, how can you receive um, credit under what's a new pilot program, you know, it's certainly always interesting. Um, I would agree with you, Tom, that, you know, overall, that there's nothing dramatic in terms of how things have changed from DOJ's perspective. Um, but I think there's two things that are important here to think about. One is um, that the DOJ does seem to be listening to corporations and to their outside counsel about, you know, if, if you have an effective compliance program and you self-disclose, you know, does that really help the company either, um, you know, either seek ultimately a declination and prosecution or a reduction in fine? You know, and that's been an ongoing discussion in the compliance community. Um, DOJ responded first, you know, in the Morgan Stanley case um, when they declined to prosecute Morgan Stanley. And here, you know, they're setting up a pilot program for a year, um, giving companies the opportunity to either secure full cooperation credit, you know, if they take certain steps. Um, or some kind of partial cooperation credit that we can discuss, you know, depending on, again, the level of cooperation and steps that a company takes either before the self-disclosure or during uh, an investigation and self-disclosure with the Department of Justice. Stephen, you've had uh, experience working in the DOJ. Could you maybe give your opinion on what it means when the department has a pilot program as opposed to a, a change or something that, that is permanent? Uh, because sitting here from the outside uh, as myself, it appears when uh, for the government to make a change, it has to go through lots of you know meetings and reviews and considerations. And so, is there really any difference between a permanent change and a pilot program? Well, I mean, I, you know, that's probably a good question, Tom. I mean, you know, certainly a permanent change is something that you know, gets finalized by the Department of Justice, and that, that's going to be the process going forward. Um, you know, here, I, I think what the department was trying to do is set up a program for a year as on kind of a test basis, um, with the idea, I think this is 
how they're going to probably handle prosecutions going forward, but really trying to to show companies that the department is interested and willing to listen um, to how this program should be modified, you know, after the one year time period or things that, you know, the Department of Justice learns from that, that might be helpful going forward from the prosecution side. I mean, this is, you know, it's not going away as an example. Um, you know, the Department of Justice and the FBI have both increased, and this was part of the announcement, substantial resources in the prosecution or investigation and prosecution of FCPA cases. Um, the, the fraud division is doubling their prosecutors, you know, so they're, they're hiring 10 new prosecutors. The FBI has created three new units um, to work on FC, uh, FCPA uh, specific types of cases. You know, so it, it's clearly a continued focus and there's enhanced resources around it. You know, and here what they're trying to do is obviously encourage companies to self-disclose. Um, you know, and that that's really the idea. And, and I think they're going to continue to work and modify the program to the extent that it'll work best for um, the DOJ and for companies. Well, Stephen, you, you've been uh, both in-house and in private practice. And hasn't the DOJ really always encouraged uh, self-disclosure and, and made it clear that companies could receive significant credit credit uh, in a reduction uh, under the sentencing guidelines from self-disclosure? What's new about that? Well, uh, you know, at the base level, like you pointed out, there's nothing new about encouraging self-disclosure. I think the major question for companies and, you know, for my clients, certainly you've seen it, you know, anybody who's practiced in the Bay Area has seen it, is that, you know, if, if you go into a company that has an issue or concern and they're looking to potentially make a decision on whether to disclose or not disclose to the Department of Justice, the question you always get from the general counsel, from the CEO, from the board of directors is, you know, how do we know we will get credit and what does that credit really look like? You know, we're basically walking in and telling the Department of Justice an issue and giving them, you know, a free pass to investigate us without any understanding of what that cooperation credit or self-disclosure actually means. You know, and that, that was always a tough discussion with senior management board of directors because, you know, what they look at publicly are these huge fines, huge investigation expenses, you know, and they don't really understand or see the fact that, you know, a number of cases are either decline, decline for prosecution, you know, or never really go forward. Um, you, you only see the ones that, you know, the resulting settlements that are out there and the fines. And so, you know, it had been a very tough discussion to have with senior management board of directors. You know, this, I think, helps continue to clarify. You can point directly to um, this new guidance that talks about, you know, if you take the following step, um, the, the DOJ will, quote, consider declining prosecution. Um, if they don't do that, you get a reduction in fine up to 50% off of the bottom level from the sentencing guidelines and not require the appointment of a monitor. So some, some very clear statements from the Department of Justice as to, you know, what does it mean to self-disclose and cooperate? And yes, you as senior management and board of directors, you know, if you go this route, understand that, you know, you're, you're doing something that you think is in the best interest of your stakeholders and your company. Stephen, you and I had the chance to visit about the uh, sort of the November timeframe of public announcements around the new Compliance Council uh, you know, we've touched upon the Yates memo. Do you see this uh, new release of information by the department as sort of a continuation of what really or may have begun with the Yates memo and, and through the uh, appointment of Wei Chen and the announcements and pronouncements about her position? Yeah, I mean, I think Andrew Weitzman has taken some very clear steps forward in terms of, um, you know, what he wants to do with the fraud section and DOJ and Leslie Caldwell, what they want to do overall in terms of these FCPA prosecutions, um, you know, if you look, it's kind of a, a, an evolution of how they're thinking about this, because if you go from the Yates memo, you know, it's really the focus on now individual prosecutions, but it's not just going to be, and it's, that's always been a possibility, but making it clear to companies that, you know, individuals are certainly going to be on the hook, and as you cooperate with us, we're going to expect you, um, you know, to, to uh, be cognizant and focused on the fact that individuals, you know, are directly in line of prosecution on these things. Um, and companies are going to have to make some very difficult decisions around, around those kinds of issues. You know, then with the appointment of the first ever compliant uh, capital for the Department of Justice, that was a, you know, very critical step forward 
to me, and as you know, I practice in this area. I used to be a federal prosecutor. I used to be in-house as, you know, as a compliance officer in major companies, um, you know, just like Wei Shen was. And to me, it was a clear signal to companies about um, you need to have an effective compliance program, you know, not only to protect the company, um, but also to respond to government investigations. And we're going to be looking very closely at um, the effectiveness of your compliance program. You know, it, and, it, and it used to be that, you know, companies sort of understood that. Now you have somebody there who used to be a federal prosecutor, used to be an in-house compliance officer, knows how things work. And, and it's kind of a double-edged sword for companies, right? Because um, she, she's very clear, clearly understands what it means to be a business operating around the world as a multinational and the challenges that compliance officers and legal counsel face on those fronts but also exactly what the expectations are going to be. And, you know, she's going to be directly involved in, you know, reviewing compliance programs of companies under investigation, reviewing compliance programs and remediation steps for companies that are looking to resolve issues and dealing directly with monitor situations as well um, in how a compliance program, you know, is ultimately um, perceived by the Department of Justice, you know, during and, and after investigation. And that's really a critical thing for companies to be thinking about. And then this is the next stage forward, which is, you know, we, we want to encourage, as we always have, voluntary disclosure, and we're going to outline what those steps mean uh, for companies in terms of how do you get, how do you come in and talk to us about voluntary disclosure? What are going to be um, the requirements there, you know, that you have to that be involved in? Um, what does full cooperation look like and the credit you get? And then what are your remediation activities, including your internal controls and your compliance program? You know, and so it's, it's been a very collective effort um, over kind of the last, you know, six or nine months of really trying to clarify for companies, boards of directors, senior management, compliance officers, general counsel, you know, what are the expectations when you talk about FCPA and the Department of Justice and your own responsibilities as a company uh, to have an effective compliance program? Even as an outside counsel advocate advising companies, uh, it seems like you're saying that th this, th these kind of three steps, if I could put them together, the Yates memo, the uh, compliance council, but but this uh, release uh, this this past week really give uh, outside counsel something that they can uh, point to directly to boards of directors or other senior management, as opposed to saying we think this is what the department is going. Uh, did I hear that from you correctly? Yeah, no, it's a great point, Tom, and that's exactly right. You know, because here you can talk about, um, you know, a 50% reduction, a, you know, the fact that there may be a declination in prosecution, <clears throat> um, a decision of whether you voluntarily self-report or don't self-report, what that means for a potential reduction off of a, a fine that might come, you know, further down the road. You know, and so those things I think you can point very clearly if you're a compliance officer or general counsel to a board or senior management about if we're making a decision about whether to self-disclose or not, here are the benefits versus the risk. But it was much harder to understand those. Um, you know, it wasn't quite as detailed out there for people to think about that kind of risk uh, reward approach on, on self-disclosure. You know, and it also makes it clear to me um, much more around, quote, as you know, the return on investment for compliance. You know, for a long time, compliance and, and compliance officers still face this, is that, you know, it's a cost of doing business or compliance is a cost center. Well, you know, the reality is if, if you're doing compliance the right way inside of a company and you're working on strategic business initiatives and you're working with the management and the business unit leaders, what you're really trying to do is help the company be proactive help it understand and reduce its risk profile and maximize profitability. And if you're doing your job as a compliance officer in that fashion, you know, you're not a cost center. You're actually a real benefit to the business. But sometimes that's hard to understand for, you know, executives when they're looking at budgets and costs. You know, this then also gives a very clear message that if you invest in your compliance program and you have an effective compliance program, it's going to protect the business. If you take the Morgan Stanley defense and you take, you know, this this guidance where it talks about considering declining prosecution if you do the right things and you have the right compliance program, you know, those are very clear signals to companies about why this is a great return on investment for shareholders and executives and the board and really protecting everybody at the end of the day. 
Do I'd like to turn now to uh, number three in the trioka, which is timely and appropriate remediation in FCPA matters. And here we got some very interesting specific guidance from the department about the types of remediations and implementations of program enhancements they'd like to see. And one of the things they, or a couple of things struck me, one was uh, really focusing on the quality of the chief compliance officer and the compliance function within the company. The second thing was the uh, uh, a couple of uh, phrases around the resources given to the compliance function. And we've really not seen the department focus uh, so specifically on uh, making sure that the compliance function is both talented or well-versed and also has both adequate resources or adequate resources, I should say, both in terms of headcount and money. Is that uh, something new or have you sort of seen this developing as we go along? You well, know, um, you and I have talked about this or, you know, we, and we certainly talked about it in the, in the industry about what the original perception was, you know, and it really was that you had to have a compliance officer, he or she had to have adequate resources, authority level, and access to senior management board of directors. And that really was all of the detail that was provided. Um, you know, and then there have been some um, steps around, you know, the 2012 FCPA, DOJ and SEC guidance um, that list some of the, the you know, their nine elements about um, how do you evaluate a compliance program, the UK Bribery Act, the sentence gui sentencing guidelines, OECD guidelines have always, you know, given some guidance there. But I agree with you that, you know, here um, they were talking about what does it really mean to have a sufficient effort, at least under this pilot program, about a well-resourced, um, effective, and audited compliance program. And, you know, and they talk about the culture of compliance and what that means that the companies are required to dedicate um, sufficient resources in the program, that you really have to invest in qualified experience and, and appropriately compensated um, compliance personnel. And, you know, we have seen, you and I have both seen the compliance officer position become, you know, more high profile, more professional, more focused, but it's also always been an issue about, you know, the level and the quality of people, you know, and making sure that they're C-level and that they're compensated appropriately and have the right access. And so I think, you know, that they're certainly trying to take on that issue as well, um, that you have to have sufficient independence of the compliance function. You know, and this has been a discussion about who should the compliance officer report to, you know, where do he, and he or she sit in the organization. And there's some very clear, um, you know, discussion points about whether somebody should be in legal or outside of legal, you know, not the least of which is attorney-client privilege and those issues. Um, there are certain industry requirements or expectations that change those, but, you know, to me that really matters what type of company you have and who's the general counsel, who's the chief compliance officer, who is the senior management, and so you make those kind of tailored to companies. Um, one of the things that, you know, I focus a lot of time on is, you know, tailoring the compliance efforts based on an effective risk assessment, and that point's made clear in the guidance as well, and really trying to think about, you know, how do you do effective risk assessments, whether it's in the FCP area, uh, FCPA area, or much broader uh, along a number of compliance topics. You know, and then you have to have, um, you know, robust reporting, um, hotline, investigation, and disciplinary procedures, you know, and be able to document all of those things. And, you know, those are all going to be things that the DOJ's new compliance council looks deeply at um, when, they, when the government is evaluating cooperation and remediation efforts for companies under investigation. But more important, if you do those things and have those elements in your compliance program and you do compliance program reviews and assessments and you really look at the risk of the company and you build your compliance program around it and continue to enhance the program, that's how senior management board of directors protect their organization, you know, and that's something that I think we really have to be focused on now. And Stephen, the memo ends with uh, entitled uh, "Credit for Business Organizations Under the Pilot Program," and, and really lays out in a way I don't think I've ever seen, at least in print before, the uh, available limits of credit uh, for both uh, uh, cooperation and remediation without self-disclosure, and then conversely with self-disclosure. And uh, once again, you talked about the importance of being able to point to a number or a document, excuse me, a number in a document to senior management. 
uh, is, is, and that's in the context of the pilot program, is, is this something that you think the DOJ is responding to, if not criticism, certainly uh, commentary from the compliance community? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, I mean, if you look at a chart of FCPA fines over the last 10 years, you can clearly see the escalation in penalties that are associated with that. As you and I both know, you know, it's not just the penalty that you pay to the Department of Justice. It's, you know, the investigation costs and forensics costs and the lawyers and accountants and everybody else that's involved in it, um, not to mention the negative reputational impact on the company, the financial impact, potentially the operational impact. You know, and so the cost of these things are, you know, are very serious. And, you know, that's one of the things that goes into the self-disclosure is thinking about it. And I think, you know, people have seen such high, significantly increasing fines, and companies get more and more concerned, well, we're just going to be the next notch on that list. Or, you know, now instead of coming in and it may have been X dollars in fines, it looks potentially much worse for us. You know, here what the DOJ said is um, – where a company voluntary, voluntarily discloses its FCPA misconduct and satisfies the other conditions in the pilot program, the DOJ will consider declining prosecution. If they don't issue a declination, then the DOJ may give up to 50% reduction off of the bottom end of the fine range if you meet those requirements. You know, and, and that's pretty significant because now you're putting an actual number to it, showing a company that they could get a 50% reduction off of the fine if they come in, cooperate, assist the government with full cooperation, and remediate any of the issues. And you then will generally not be required to have a monitor, you know, which is another significant cost and a long-term commitment for companies when they're forced into monitorships. You know, so that's a number that can be tied to, you know, if you meet our expectations. What they also did in this guidance was said, well, where a company doesn't voluntarily self-report its misconduct, you know, so the government finds out about it, it's publicly reported, you know, however the DOJ, you know, might get the information, the fraud section will still give up to a 25% reduction off of the bottom of the fine guidelines if you meet the rest of the cooperation expectations and remediation expectations. You know, so that's very significant as well, which is, you know, if you as a company didn't uh, step forward and self-disclose, um, hopefully that it wasn't an intentional reason, but even even if it was publicly announced or we found out about it, if you come in and fully cooperate and remediate the issue, you can still get compliance credit um, off of an, uh, an ultimate settlement. And, you know, those are things that are directly tied to, you know, the concerns that the business and compliance community have had about escalating fines, uncertainty of how things would be handled, Department of Justice, and more importantly, what actual credit do we get? How can I point to a number that I know that this is meaningful for us to come in and, and work and cooperate? Stephen, unfortunately, we're near the end of our time, but uh, any sort of final thoughts uh, you might have about uh, this document or how someone like uh, yourself in private practice uh, would use it going forward? If you haven't already told us about. No, I mean I think the you know the the, the key issues are the ones that, that we've talked about here. Um, you know, there's an increase in, in focused FCPA investigation resources, both by the Department of Justice and the F and the FBI. You know, so this issue is not declining, it's gonna increase in terms of investigations that are going forward in prosecutions. The DOJ made a clear point about enhanced global coordination that they're going to be working with their foreign counterpart, uh, counterparts in uh, other countries to hold corrupt individuals and companies um, accountable. And that certainly has been on the increase, but now they're making it a very clear point. Um, you know, that we talked about the three areas about self-disclosure, full cooperation, and remediation and compliance program. And then, you know, to me, the last thing is really you know, judging the effectiveness of your program, making sure that you understand, you know, does your program meet the base level expectations? What are things that you can do to enhance it? Are you effectively um, conducting risk assessments? Because I think a lot of companies struggle in, in doing those. And then are you auditing and monitoring your program going forward and the key issues and the key risks, you know, to show that you have a fully integrated, effective compliance program um, that you can both use internally for tracking of issues, um, that you could show to the Department of Justice to support the company in a declination, you know, or make sure that the company is protected to the greatest extent possible. And then are you using that information to both effectively report up through senior management to the board of directors, as well as 
starting to understand how to use that data proactively to influence behavior in your corporation. So again, going back to my key point, which is a compliance program that's run at the level that it should be is really designed and tailored to helping the business reduce risk and maximize profitability and secondarily concerned about making sure you meet government expectations. Because if you're doing it the right way, you can do both. So those are kind of my key takeaways. Um, you know, certainly the, the, the DOJ is going to continue to focus on what does your compliance program look like and is it effective? And so, you know, companies should be encouraged to really understand and look at those, whether they're doing it internally or externally with resources that can help them in the, in the various areas. Well, Stephen, uh, as always, uh, I certainly have learned a lot in uh, every time we do one of these podcasts. So I want to thank you, but I also wanted to ask if anyone wanted to follow up with uh, you directly on uh, anything you said, uh, could they do so? And if so, how would they do it? Oh, sure. No, I'd be happy to talk to anybody about that. Um, you know, they can reach me at Arnold and Porter. Um, my office number is 303-863-2320. And my email is stephen.martin at aporter.com. So S-T-E-P-H-E-N dot Martin, M-A-R-T-I-N at a P-O-R-T-E-R dot com. And I'd be happy to talk to anybody about uh, the compliance program and, and what the expectations are, or I might be able to help them if they had any concerns or issues, whether it's proactive, which is most of the work I like to do in helping companies, or on the investigation front as well if companies face issues. So um, I really appreciate you inviting me to do this, Tom. And as always, it's been great. You know, you have the best blog out there, and you know, I really enjoy it. It's, uh, <laughs> well, thank it's you. always you always you always are interesting and entertaining, and um, you know, all kinds of pop culture and interesting historical references. So it's really fantastic what you're doing for the community. Thanks a lot, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Sounds great. Thank you very much. Have a great day.